Good, fellas. Sounds Pearson. like a man that is well aware Daniel Jones will be a free agent <laughs> when this season ends. Well, let me ask you this, because, like, poor – here's Brian Dayball, who's one of the Coach of the Year candidates, right? I mean, like, the Giants have exceeded all expectations. By far. He has done a great job with Daniel Jones. Brian Dayball has. He's done a great job with Daniel Jones. He's done a great job with this offense. Like, they didn't have any major free agent signings. Gettleman totally screwed the cap. They came in this year, you know, a lot of people said, well, the Giants are just taking it on the chin this year. And Brian Dayball and his staff said, oh, no, 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 no. And you know what? And, like, and now they're moving on to the divisional round. And yet, all people are – and now the New York media is sitting there going, like, oh, just good. He's just good. Like, they're trying to make something of nothing. Yeah, like, like, yeah. like Dayball was, yeah, Day right. was, like, complimenting Daniel Jones. So, Connor Rogers, let me ask you this. Um, uh, you are uh, – you work for SNY. You do the – you are part of the New York media. Explain yourself <laughs> here. <laughs> you are part of the New York media as Why'd part of the, of the Jets. You, you do the Jets pre and post game on <laughs> SNY. You are obviously you're part of the New York media. Explain yourself. Why are you guys attacking Brian Dayball that way? You put it all I on don't you, do man. scrums. I don't do press conferences. I just sit on television in a suit and say whatever I want. But And I'll say this. I thought Daniel Jones played great. Yesterday. All right, there you go. Absolutely great. So take that New York media or associates of mine, whatever it may be. <laughs> okay, you, might get, you might get kicked out of the New York yes. media. You might be I, stuck th with me here every day. There we go. All yes. right. I, I'll handle that. I can deal with that. <laughs> it's fine. We can get rid of Jay. It's easy. Um, I uh, think you can make a case that Daniel Jones, just with Hertz's shoulder at the moment, how bad Dak has looked, I think there's a case that he's, he's the second best quarterback in the NFC playoff field, Daniel Jones, which is incredible. After Brock Purdy? I, no, after, after Tom Brady. <laughs> oh, but I think that. Jones, the level that he's shown. Also, I think it's a testament to Brian Dable, the fact exactly. that they played with the lead the whole game, and Saquon Barkley only got nine carries. They knew exactly what they wanted to do, and they destroyed them through the game. Dan Daniel Jones, who has, let's be clear, had an up-and-down relationship with fans and the New York media and, you know, and coaching staffs, give this guy all sorts of credit. Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones become the first quarterback in NFL postseason history with over 300 passing yards, Two, two or more passing touchdowns and over 70 rushing yards. The only guy in NFL postseason history to ever do that, that was Daniel Jones. He was nothing short of terrific. You can see it there on your screen. 24 of 35 for 301 yards, and then 17 rushes for 78 yards. He had more rushes than Daniel than Saquon Barkley, more than Dalvin Cook on the other side <laughs> yeah, of the ball, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean... He was nothing short of terrific in this game. The Vikings, even though they'd seen him less than a month ago, didn't have an answer for Daniel Jones Lawrence. Yeah, and the last time, this is why I liked his over in passing yards, which was 241 and a half. He had only come into this game throwing over 200 yards three of his last four games, but that one game was against the Vikings where he threw for 334. So I'm like, let's, let's run it back again, and he has another – 300 yard passing day to go on top of his 78 rushes. Uh, sorry, played pretty damn good. And one of the arguments, I mean, listen, Jay, we've been talking about this on Fantasy Football Happy Hour for the, the entire year. I, you know, jokes aside, but like we've said, like Daniel Jones is fine. He is he is pretty good. When, good. We, when we're talking real life and we're talking fantasy, that rushing gives him a floor as a fantasy option. Absolutely. And also, I think that it just goes to show that, you know, Brian, <coughs> it's hard to assess coaches in the NFL, but one thing you can assess is whether a coach is adaptable. And Dable has had games where he runs Saquon Barkley 20, 25 times. And then he has games like this one where Saquon runs nine times. He only ran 14 times in the first Vikings game. The Vikings' pass defense was just a complete catastrophe. Yeah. Miscommunications. Darius Slayton, a couple times, he caught the ball expecting to get tackled. He was like, oh, there's no one here. I can just keep running. Wide open. And even didn't catch the ball when no one was exactly. around at one time. Hey, so, yeah, that was a tough one. I mean, it's the story of the Vikings season on the back end, and I think it finally caught up to them. And to your point about Barkley, they really know how to use the pass game to him as an extension of the run game. The five catches for 56 yards just felt like free yards all day. Uh, 100%. They schemed him open. I, I Look, I, I think there was no bigger example throughout the entire playoffs. Eh, maybe Jacksonville. Uh, maybe Jacksonville <laughs> Chargers. But what I was going to say is, is like, like – Kevin O'Connell got outcoached here. Yes. And, yeah. and like, and not close, right? I mean, like, it was just like, Dayball just completely outcoached Kevin O'Connell because I would, if you sat here and just showed me both rosters, you're taking the Vikings roster, right? I mean, that's a better collection of players than what the Giants have. I mean, listen, give the Giants credit for getting something out of Isaiah Hodgins and, you know, and, and Richie James, but let's be clear. Like, they've got, they, I mean, like, you know, Dalvin and Saquon, like, I think the offensive lines are a wash, right? I mean, 
I think Cousins and Jones are more or less a wild. I mean, after this game, maybe you don't think that way. But, like, they have Justin Jefferson. Uh, they have Adam Thielen. They have TJ Hawkinson. Cook. They have Adam, you know, Adam, KJ Osborne. Like, they they have a better, they ha- they certainly have a better offense, at least on, on paper. Um, Look at they, these what the nights. Giants are working with. Hodgson, Slater, James. I this mean, is the new uh, Randy Moss, Wes Welker. <laughs> <laughs> Hodgins from a practice squad. Slayton written he, off by his own team by the previous regime. Richie yeah. James, career special teamer. Daniel Bellinger, a day three pick at tight end. That is your Giants leader. Look down. They, they hyped up right here. They are hyped up. Another Him. big hat. <laughs> the big, big hats have become a thing. They are celebrating, and they deserve to celebrate, especially Isaiah Hodgins, who, you know, Eight for 105 and a touchdown in this one. Uh, he was a free agent at one point, um, yeah. you know, and he continues to develop this chemistry, especially in the red zone. He's now got five receiving touchdowns in his last six games with Daniel Jones. Uh, look, I think everyone expects the Eagles to win next week, and I, I would pick them as well, but I think that game's going to be closer. I don't know what the line – what's the – Seven. Oh, seven. seven. I, give me the Giants to cover. Yeah. I would bet the Giants to cover right now. Like, very live. I, I'm just telling you, like – that, that is a team that really believes in each other. On the other side of the ball, just as we talk about sort of coaching disparities, again, probably Peterson Staley is probably the, the most glaring, but this one was glaring to me. You've got number 18, Justin Jefferson, who gets one catch in the second half. He had three targets, one reception for four yards in the second half, just three targets. Now, the, the people that are trying to, you know, defending him, defending Cousins, defending O'Connell, and they're like, wow. He was, you know, they brought safety help over the top quite a bit against Jefferson. They, 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 he was double teamed a lot. They bracketed him. Like, they did a lot of different things to try to take Jefferson out of the game. I hear you. I get it. But think about that Week 12 game against the Patriots where he also had coverage shifted his way quite a bit, where he was often double teamed, where Belichick was like, I'm not going to let Justin yeah. Jefferson beat me. Nine for 139 and a touchdown on 11 targets against the Patriots in Week 11. One of the criticisms of Kirk Cousins throughout his career, and you know this, Connor, better than anyone, is that he won't throw to guys unless they're open. Like, he won't throw to a guy who's currently (laughs) covered and trust his receivers to win in coverage. And I get that on some level, but there are some guys that you just throw, even if they're covered, because you trust them to make a play, you trust them to win those 50-50 balls. And is there a guy in the NFL more than that guy, Justin Jefferson? Like, he's that guy right now. Yeah, and, and as you're saying this, I'm thinking of the game, the the Vikings against Buffalo, where he did it. He literally threw it to him. Like, he's like, hey, you know how they say, man, Justin Jefferson, he out there somewhere to close his eyes. And, yep. and that's and just, probably right, that, the best catch of the that's season, exactly right? That's exactly what it looked like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, th- but I also thought about how you just said, you know, Kirk Cousins hitting the, like, wide-ass open receiver. And I think to K.J. Osborne's touchdown yesterday – Kirk Cousins found him. He, you know, I mean, he. That's where you're. Sp- you want to throw to the wide open receiver, right? But when you're, when, when the game's on the line, right? You get the ball. You get the ball to your guy. Like if the Vikings would have won this game, then him having seven catches for 47 yards. All right, cool. We chalk that up. We move on to the next week. But you did it win, and you only had one catch in the second half. So something got to give. Well, and it's not the reason they lost the game, but there's going to be so much magnification on that last play, the fourth down where he throws short to the stick. He shows – Here it he, is. Th- here's the play right here. He thought he was going to get sacked is the thing. He said right. rush up the middle. So he thought he had just had to go, but he probably just have to toss it up to Justin Jefferson instead of uh, taking the out. Right, yeah. And, uh, you know, our colleague uh, Drew Dinsick saying cousin short of the sticks on the key fourth down was like minus 1,500, <laughs> right? It just – very on brand. Very on brand. Look, the Giants got a Dory Jackson back in the secondary. That obviously helped. That was a big boost. But still, three targets in the second half is inexcusable for a game in which you're trailing. To your point, the Giants led the entire way. Yeah, it's inexcusable. I mean, he's the best wide receiver in football. And yeah. it, it just they didn't utilize him even as a decoy the right way, it felt and, like. And we'll have the whole offseason to talk about the Vikings. But it's weird because, like, Justin Jefferson's my number one wide receiver and my number one player overall for fantasy drafts. Yeah. I think you can make a strong argument that after Kelsey, Hawkinson should be tight end too. We'll see how Andrews finishes the season. We'll see if Lamar Jackson's back with the Ravens and what that offense looks like. But, like, even if you go Andrews at two, like, hard to argue for Hawkinson any lower than three, even given what Kittle's done recently. I mean, you know, so just an incredible, you know, incredible game by Hawkinson, 10 for 129. 
uh, you know, almost a 30% target share against the Giants. And obviously, Dalvin Cook's going to be a, you know, a number one wide, res- a number one running back, you know, a top 10 running back next year. So it's. <sighs> we will talk about them a lot. I feel, I feel for, I have a lot of Vikings friends, a lot of friends that are Vikings fans, including Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, our colleague, and you know, who comes on every week on uh, football, fantasy football pregame. And I just feel bad for them. Like you know, like it's a tough loss. It's a tough loss. I mean, like, because I'm a Commanders fan. I know we suck. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, my hope never gets up because I know how horrible we are. Like, I know it's only going to be Dak. But, you know, like, I, you know, they had hope. It was a winnable game, but the Giants were the better team by a fair bit. Don't, right. don't feel too bad. We did get word of where the Vikings are going. Oh, post-game as, celebration for the Vikings. The Let's see this. Uh, does get rolling, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> this is from NFL Memes. <laughs> They are off to the Caribbean, <laughs> it appears. Oh, dear. Oh, cock. Let me throw it further down the field, cock. Ain't no better way to deal with it, though, right? I, the people, I don't know who runs NFL memes, like NFL memes IG and NFL memes. <laughs> it, it might be Lord. Whoever does. I confess. Does a great job. That account is so good. That's good. It, and good but content. not only are they good, they're good and they're funny, but you know what? It's immediate. Like immediately, as soon as the game's over, yeah, they immediately yeah, they, like they, got they five or six they jokes. They, they got to make with them it. for both outcomes. Like, That's the only explanation. We should tell Pat Corrine to buy them. Yes, yes a good investment yeah. for Pat. Corain. That would be a good account. That would be a good investment for uh, Pat Crane. It's unbelievable. Anyway, right. So that's the they had the Viking celebration. They just put Caribbean music underneath it. <laughs> just, just so good. Our last game to so recap good. here, guys. The 49ers, Brock Purdy, four touchdowns in his playoff debut. Uh, they just steamrolled the Seahawks in the second half to a 41 to 23 win where Kyle Shanahan did what Kyle Shanahan does but Purdy did make some plays extending them and Christian McCaffrey found the end zone pretty easily in this one against the Seahawks defense that did not have much the entire day. Yep. To me the thing with this game is that the first drive Brock Purdy looked terrible. Shell he looked shot. absolutely awful and it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter because there's so much talent around him. Shanahan's so good as a play caller. Look how open you can be terrible yeah, on 50% right. of your plays as the 49ers quarterback. Yeah. As long as you don't turn it over, it's Look fine. at Debo. I knew right. he was going to be back. So, right. I mean, but, like, so we just saw, for people that are listening um, we, or watching on YouTube, you didn't see the plays, but we just saw three of Brock Purdy's touchdown passes. The first one to McCaffrey, the second one to Elijah Mitchell, and then the Debo one. The Debo one, whatever. He hits him in a 10-yard flat, and Debo does the rest of the work. Okay, fine. That's Shanahan, and that's Debo scheming it up. But give Purdy a little yes. bit of credit, because on the McCaffrey and the Mitchell ones, even though they were short, they were you know inside the 20, the fact is that in both cases, he maneuvered to avoid the rush, extended the play, and found the open man. I don't believe Mitchell or McCaffrey were the first read on either one of those plays. And so credit him to extending the play enough to find the open guy and then letting his playmakers make a play. Like, again, like, you can sit here and say, like, oh, all he's doing is hitting layups. But there's something to be said for hitting layups. Yeah, that's big plays. Right? It, yeah, it, it's – it. F- People, it, it's okay to acknowledge one thing and another. Like exactly. it's it's okay to acknowledge that there's an all pro at damn near every position for the 49ers. But if you could just put anybody back there, it wouldn't be Brock Purdy. Nobody would choose a seventh round rookie to do it. He's never flinched. He hasn't always played perfect because nobody does, but he's never flinched from coming in in the Dolphins game. Like he didn't wake up that day and was like, I'm about to go beat the Dolphins today. Nah, he just, you can acknowledge that he's balling. He's doing his job with what he got and that the team is in, good. In the, in the second half, he was 9 of 11, 185 yards, three total touchdowns. Remember, he also had the rushing touchdown as well. And, and right, you know, he's had at least two touchdown passes in every single game he's playing. Like, again, there's, you know, and this is always the knock on Brady and everything like that, but like, oh, Brock Purdy's a system quarterback. Okay. Well, that's the system he is. There's a number, and I don't think Brady's a system quarterback. I don't buy any of that. You know, that's a ridiculous argument. But my fact is, the, the point is, is that so many quarterbacks are at least on some level a product of the coaching and the environment they're in. Again, we just talked about it. Think about Daniel Jones under Brian Dayball versus Daniel Jones under some of the other coaches he's had. Joe Judge. R- right? Yeah, against, uh, under Joe Judge. Think about, think about the, that comparison right there. Honestly, even Kirk Cousins. Obviously, disappointing into the season, but Kirk Cousins was a better quarterback this year under Kevin O'Connell than he was, you know, um, under Mike Zimmer. Yep. Right, to he's me, a defensive coach, so it's not really fair. But you, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, 
quarterbacks are often a product of their system and the offense and the players around them. And so, like, you can't fault Brock Purdy for taking advantage of he's, you know, Okay, great. Yeah. You were Delta Royal flush, but you yeah. know what? You're playing it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. To me, Brock Purdy's not even the story. Brock Purdy's been doing this for six weeks. Yeah. To me, the story is Debo Samuel. Yes, and the fact sir. that he goes for 165 <laughs> total yards, a touchdown. He's can't tackle this guy. No one ever sticks the yeah. first tackle. Yeah. I've never seen yeah. anyone with core strength like he this. He looks it's healthy. Insane. That's the key. Yes. He looks yeah, healthy. He's he, back. he used week 18 to get his feet wet, gave him a couple touches. He back back now. Yep, he's the story. And then Christian McCaffrey just does what Christian McCaffrey does, the most anonymous 119-yard rushing game that you'll ever see. Uh, goes for 2 for 17 in the air and a touchdown. This team is just completely loaded. It's they're, insane. They're 9-2 and two against the spread, um, uh, you know, and it's unbelievable sort of what just all the weapons they have. Credit John Lynch and the entire front office there for assembling this. I agree with you that Debo Samuel, who I think a lot of people are like, how healthy is he? Can you Damn trust healthy. him? But He's really healthy, obviously, moving forward here. One last thing on Purdy. I just wanted to look this up real quickly. I was just looking this up. So just, again, QBR is a stat that ESPN Stats Information came up with that sort of uh, I think is a really good stat. And it's just a, on a scale of 1 to 100, there's a lot that goes into it. I won't bore you with all the, the underlying metrics. But just basically how well did a quarterback play? It waits, you know, it waits when throws were made, what the score of the game was, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, Geno Smith in this game had a QBR. Again, this is on a scale of 1 to 100, 65.8. Brock Purdy, 89.6. Yep. For context there, Patrick Mahomes finished the season at 77. Yeah, I mean, so, like, again, like, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, that's elite. 89 is it elite. It is elite, elite. Right, again, to your point, Patrick Holmes was sub-80, and yeah. this guy was just almost hit 90 in this game. So, I, you know, listen, I, it's going to be – it's a great story. Credit to Brock Purdy. Credit to Kyle Shanahan. Um, it's obviously – it's not a fair comparison with what Skylar Thompson or some of these other guys – have, but, like, he's been given a great opportunity. He's making the most of it. And it's going to be really interesting to see if the Niners make the Super Bowl, which I think they have a very legitimate chance to do. Right. What happens with Brock Purdy next year? If Garoppolo comes back, right, you know, I mean, Trey, Trey Lance. Lance. I mean, they spent all that in. But there's nothing that we've seen out of Trey Lance that gives you any kind of confidence. The way Brock Purdy's undefeated. Yeah. Can't beat him. I mean, yeah. like, I mean like, it's, it's, it's craziness. Just a, yeah. I mean, <laughs> goodness gracious. Head is spinning. Going to be a fascinating it's gonna be, offseason story it's gonna to be watch fascinating. when we uh, get there. Listen, and, you know, listen, so, listen, sometimes you get drafted by Kyle Shannon, sometimes you get drafted by Brandon Staley. What are you going to do? <laughs> With that, we're going to break. We're back we're talking Bucks Cowboys with a little proper shot action right after this. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least – being too lazy to click out of it after the, you know, autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotor World, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.